All right, I think we're going to start now. Hello, everybody. I'm Ira Kirschbaum. I have the pleasure of being the editor of the Journal of Orthopedic Experience Innovation. And as you know, uh, every uh, first and third Wednesday, we have a journal club with a topic that is based on one of our key articles. Um, the article uh, tonight uh, originally was uh, was entitled um, Virtual uh, Reality for Surgical Represent Representatives in Learning About the Operating Room, but we expanded the topic tonight for VR, for surgery, and for training in general. Um, we have for us uh, tonight two of the authors, um, Danny Goel, as well as Ryan Lohr. I'd like to, you both to introduce yourself first, just in alphabetical order. Danny, please go first. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about some of the credentials in VR and where you are surgically and uh, give us an introduction. Thanks, Ira. I really appreciate you hosting this. Uh, as Ira mentioned, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I specialize in shoulder. I did have the privilege of training with JP uh, in Boston, uh, Larry Higgins and uh, George Athwal and others in London. Ontario. Uh, this is my 12th year in practice. About six years ago, I started uh, Precision OS with two game developers, and that interest comes mostly out of recognizing the problem that we have in medical education. And uh, we've been at this for now about six, five, just under five and a half years. And it's been an exciting journey. I look forward to discussing with all of you today. That's great. And Ryan? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, too, am an orthopedic shoulder surgeon, just like Danny, and I also trained under J.P. Warner, as well as Basim Al Hassan, and I'm currently working at uh, Mass General Hospital here in Boston. Uh, I met Danny Goyle in my residency in Vancouver in British Columbia, and he's uh, I've been along on some of the Precision OS and VR journey with him and worked on, uh, on a number of publications with him, including the one we're going to be talking about tonight. Excellent. So, Danny, I'd like to, uh, <clears throat> you and Ryan, well, you could both answer separately. Um, what have I been doing wrong? I have I trained by observing other people. Then they gave me the knife. I made a couple of incisions. They told me it was wrong. They told, So what's the promise of VR in, in surgery? And That's the first question. And I'd like to also for you guys to address what really is the technology how how does this stuff really work yeah so one of the uh, perspectives that i've started taking on this for the last year and a half or so is as opposed to talking about the solution i think you know to your point i rise you know do you recognize that there's a problem with medical education that's the first and most important thing because if you don't then it doesn't matter what the solution is if you do uh, there's several things that need to be considered is, you know, how do we learn? How have we been learning? What's the frequency of that type of learning? What's the data we get from that learning? And then how does that translate to the expectations we have in the operating room? If you look at those four pillars of medical education and say that, yes, we have a problem with each of those, then the solution becomes very, very apparent. And so it's not a thing that you've been doing wrong for the last, you know, years that you've been in practice. We've been given these tools to educate us medically, and we've done the best we can with them. In comes a new technology, which is really, it's in its infancy, but it's really sparked a big interest because it somehow addresses and checks off those four things that I mentioned with respect to medical education. I'll pause there and add if, uh, see if Ryan wants to add anything. That was a really good answer. Um, one thing that I'd like to add is that you have to recognize that virtual reality is really a form of simulation, but it's a, an advanced form of simulation. And so, you know, I'm coming from one of the newer generations of training, and we have to recognize that when we are doing those cuts, like you said, and, uh, and we are being taken along by someone else uh, when we're doing our training, we have to recognize what our limitations are, and we have to really take the time to step back and see how much knowledge do I actually have up until all of these key steps and how can I better improve? And I think if we have access to this form of simulation, this new technology, new technology where we can really take the time to learn the key steps and expand our knowledge, then the next time that you give me the opportunity to cut, I think it's it's going to be better. Excellent. I 
I want to ask, uh, I want to make a statement to everyone who's listening. If you have a question, you could either put it in a chat and then I'll call on you to ask it, or you could interrupt. We're fine with that as well. I mean, you know, it's really good. Um, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible at any point in time. You could put something in the chat or ask a question right away. I just want to make that clear. Um, maybe for uh, for a layman, you know, let's say we're at a we're at a party together, and I ask you, explain to me the technology behind VR. What is it? What really is it? You know, I think the simplest answer, Ira, would be it's a a fully interactive three dimensional environment, uh, and it's based in a VR based headset, so it's all immersive mm -hmm. and. It's one of these things where when you describe it to somebody and you show them a video, they don't actually capture the essence and the power of what it actually does. And that's why the demos, the demos are really, really critical for people who are interested in the technology, whether it be a residency program, a fellowship program, or a medical device company. And I think that some of the people in the audience I know that have had experience with this can speak to that experience and how it really differs when you show somebody a video of the experience versus what it actually can do uh, in the actual VR experience. Brian, anything on that? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that uh, it's, I think it's important for people and, and layman who aren't familiar with the technology to understand the umbrella term of uh, different forms of reality. So you hear virtual reality and some people think it's synonymous with mixed reality, some of the new technologies that are coming out are augmented reality. But really, it's this big umbrella term of extended reality. And virtual reality is on one side of the spectrum where it's an entirely virtual interactive world versus augmented or mixed where there's overlays of digital representations that you see in the real world. So virtual reality is, is different. Where do you get the... Um, like, I, I understand when I go onto a site like View Medi and I see a video and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's poor quality, sometimes it's, it's <clears throat> variable to me. You know, I I remember originally one of my, my secondary specialty would happen to be foot and ankle. And there was a video textbook of foot and ankle, which was a remarkable piece of work by Rog, Roger Mann and Michael Coughlin. And... You know, they 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 just did such high quality and broke down the operations. Where do you get the um, quality of imagery and the protocols from? You, you work with specific orthopedic surgeons, companies, and how does that get transferred over to the programmers? So it's a combination of both. So the clinical expertise we have in-house, which is on our advisory board on our website, speaks to the caliber that people involved from the medical education side. The developers we have are all AAA quality video game developers who have a lot of experience coding and making these high fidelity interactive experiences. So when you combine the two, it's sort of this critical interaction that's happened. You know, would this have happened, say, seven or eight years ago? I would say no. Uh, okay. But really, that interaction that's happened now with those two key groups that may not ever have interacted before is why we can create the product that we create, which is a simulation. That's great. That's great. Um, where do you, I mean, I actually feel, I one of the things I have a problem with as a, as a chairman of the department is after one of my attendings have been in practice for eight to 10 years, where do you learn new stuff? You know, where do you learn new stuff? So what do you think about the role of VR in new techniques that are coming out? Because, you know, you go to these courses and they're these cadaver courses for, for two hours. It's a little different. Are you able to like nonstop keep on using the VR machine until you get it? You know, because I, I think there's a great opportunity in learning new techniques as your field changes. What do you think, Ryan or Danny? Are you going? Go ahead, Ryan. I'll answer after you. Sure, answer. sure. Um, I, I think right now we, we don't know two things. We don't know what the floor is and what the ceiling is in terms of how much, how much we can learn from VR. Um, I think it's really important to be able to have the clinical experience and the tactile sensation and being able to communicate and work with teams and a lot of these soft skills that we also don't talk about a lot too. And those are sometimes things that uh, when you're, when you're doing a new skill or a new task, 
being able to communicate and coordinate and think ahead three or four steps, you know, those are some things that maybe you need some more practice for. But I think VR uh, fills a big gap in the sense that you can at least familiarize yourself, you can expose yourself to something new, uh, think about three-dimensionally how you're going to interact with that new anatomy or that new component or that new uh, sort of piece of equipment that you might use in, in practice and then use that as a building block to go forward. So I, I think there's, uh, I think VR definitely fills a role there. Danny? So it's a really big question, Ira, and I think I'll, I'll go back a little bit, a, a couple of steps and say, when we learn right now, on ViewMedi is a good platform, there's many, we have tunnel vision because what we see on ViewMedi and others is we see a window into the procedure and I'll use Walsh's Latterge video as an example. It's one of the only videos that I've seen where he actually shows what he's doing with the arm. And that's a, more of a contextual learning environment for somebody watching that video to say, when you're dissecting the subscap, this is what I do with the arm. When you put the coracoid on the glenoid, this is what I do with the arm. Whereas when we look at the videos, generally speaking, we've got the arthroscopic view or we get this view of the knee, but there's a lot of things happening around the surgery right. that allows the expert to actually perform that with ease, that how we learn and why we learn when we go to the operating room with other people. The biggest interesting part or the most interesting part about VR is we live in a very distracted world. So you've all been, everybody in this room has been to a cadaver course. There's usually one person who's been coerced into doing the dissection and everybody else is watching, talking about what they're going to do for dinner, what bottle of wine they had last night, et cetera. And I think what VR offers us is a very focused and immersive experience, which is without distraction. And what that allows us to do is actually learn in an accelerated way. And we've actually shown that in both of our studies, right. study published in JBJS American and JAMA. And then even uh, Ryan can speak about his direct translation of the OR study, where he had focused learning without distraction, which allowed him to accelerate his skill and actually then execute in the OR. Ryan, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> yeah, no, so... Um uh so th this was a case it was a a, a skiffy uh slip capital femoral epiphysis in a child who someone at an outside hospital attempted to pin uh someone who was in practice for a number of decades and hadn't really done that procedure for a long time and tried to treat it like an adult hip cannulated screw and missed the head and and a whole bunch of disasters so they transferred over to us and uh seeing that that case was coming up i you know, use the VR headset a number of times, prepared for it. Uh, there's a score that you're able to use to track your performance to see how well you're doing. And I gradually increased my performance, used less and less virtual x-rays, was able to localize uh, the tissues and the and the bony anatomy uh, more accurately after a number of repetitions and with some focused learning. And then the next day was able to uh, complete the case with about seven and a half times, I believe, less radiation and, and a significantly shorter operating room time than the failed attempt. And so the question is, you know, regardless of where you are in training, if you can recognize that there's some validity and dedicated and focused training, refresher training, being able to practice something virtually and hopefully avoid some errors in real life, I think that's that's really important. Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, again, if anyone has any questions along the way, um i have an unlimited number it's it's remarkable so i i just i i i need to ask a little bit about the um deployment of vr so so for example if i were at my hospital if i said to myself you know we see a variety a large amount of pathology that's not just in the chairman but also in the patients so mm -hmm. we see a lot of pathology in the community and um not every case is in everyone's perfect wheelhouse so if let's say the department of orthopedics at uh, bronx care health system said you know we're going to bring in we're going to deploy vr to make everyone better we are going to decide that we're going to just do a quality assurance performance improvement study how does that work out with precision os 
So we've, uh, we've validated a score, IRA, in the system, which we call a precision score. Okay. And what that does, it takes critical elements of the case, which include not only implant position, but the specifics around the implant position. So if you use the wrong size, you know, in the case of this study, the tibial tray, you put it in the wrong internal external rotation, the wrong size, the femoral cutting block, all those things go into the metrics of your precision score. And if you think about the power of that, I mean, how do we, how do we, sub, how do we objectively evaluate our trainees today? It's subjective. There is no objective measure because we don't allow them to make decisions in the operating room that could have a consequence that would be unfavorable. And so we stop them before they make that decision, never realizing what they are capable or not capable of. And I think that's the, that's where, again, you go back to say, do we have a problem with our current system of education? How does VR help? And I think that would be a way that can play a role. That's great. I mean, I think um, uh, there was a question from Kaylee Carrado. Kaylee, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Hi, I'm Kaylee. I'm a fourth year at Unicom. And I was just wondering, for residency training in particular, do you think it's more effective to start VR training early as a way of introducing interns or later on after OR experience to kind of fine tune their skills? Ryan, I'm going to pass that to you. And I, I see Brian, who's a PGY5 right now, which uh, I'd be interested in his answer, but I have a, I have a mm. comment as well. Go ahead, Ryan. Sure. sure. Um, I think the benefit uh, is one of the unique properties of VR in that it can be scalable. So in a roundabout way, I guess I'm saying is it's good for everybody that you've mentioned, both populations. Um, you can do such basic things as just 3D localization. You can do basic VR, uh, sorry, basic uh, arthroscopy in VR. And so just, you know, figuring out what the equipment looks like, getting yourself oriented so that when you see it in the OR, when you're an intern, you, you recognize what it is and at least the basic functionality of it. And then as you progress, there's a hierarchy of increasing and more challenging scenarios. For example, like we talk about in this paper, we used a revision total knee scenario. And so the surgical device representatives uh, train themselves on just the very basic one. But as you move up, there's going to be using tibial augments, femoral augments for varying degrees of bone deficiency. And so you start to become more familiar with some of the classifications. Uh, what the bone loss means, how you can adequately correct it. And so I think uh, I think you can easily scale that to whatever sort of uh, population you're looking for. Interesting. Um, there was a PGY5 you mentioned on the call, Danny. I mean, Ryan? Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm Brian Hannell, orthopedic chief resident out in Dayton, Ohio at Kettering Health. So we've, uh, we've implemented this um, pretty much uh, through – all of the levels of training. Um, I think it's, it's best to start off as early as possible. I think as, you know, I'm thinking about now how I prep for my cases, um, you know, where I, we, before we used to print out x-rays and draw on them and things like that. I wish I would have had this a lot earlier just because I would have been able to um, sit down. Actually, I could read a book, I could have gone to ortho bullets and then I can pull up my uh, on VR kind of go through the the module i can go through it with the attending get kind of feedback from the attending on you know what their thoughts are in the case and i can actually ask intelligent questions um because i've gone through the procedure already multiple times in virtual reality and i think you start that off earlier on and then you continue that not only through your training but for the rest of your career i mean that's a that's a home run in my opinion um you know i think you start off you know at your pgy3 you know, as late as PGY-5, I don't think that's it's a bad thing either, but I, I think that you've already kind of settled in your way. You're like, well, what is it going to do for me? I already feel like I'm already doing well in my surgical training. What, what else do I need to add? I already have so many, you know, commitments during the day. Why do I need to add VR to my curriculum, you know? And so I, I think starting it off early uh, is, is best. Awesome. Um, we had a question from Scott, Scott Sigmund, who if you don't know him, you're living under a rock. Scott, you had a question. Yeah, so you know we're we're using traditional learning, for example, with uh, society meetings and professional education uh, through cadavers. And I would envision that this sort of VR training uh, could really help in that regard. And so the question is, 
you know, how, how would you envision incorporating VR training for an, uh, an OLC session, for example, uh, let's just say uh, on knee replacement? Yeah, that's a great question, Scott. So the two studies that I try to answer a lot of my questions based on the available data uh, that we and others have published in using immersive VR as it's sort of known. One of the things we've shown in both those papers, the JBGS and the JAMA study, is it significantly augments your experience on the cadaver and actually allows you to maximize that experience. So both in the JBGS paper, we showed that the PGY fours and fives and in the JAMA study as well, the fours and fives actually benefited immensely by making less errors in the latter study and actually showing more technical proficiency in the first study and the second study. So I think the OLC is primed to say, you know, we're gonna spend X amount on cadavers. We have more people than we have cadavers. How do we maximize that exposure? I think that's where VR becomes part of the spectrum of education. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit that this isn't going to replace cadavers. It doesn't offer that, you know, that the fidelity of feeling that we have with cadavers. <clears throat> but what it does, it augments the experience, but it provides data. So imagine, and this is what we did with the ASCS or our plans are, we tried to do this at our first course, is imagine having data available to you on how people think and behave about a procedure before they actually get to a course. And then all of a sudden you cater your education to the needs of the people who are present, as opposed to just using a carte blanche approach to educating a group of people where you don't know where their level of education and knowledge is. That, that's, that, that is amazing that you can do that in combination with the cadaver course. Uh, Jose, you had a comment, Jose Chacon? Yes, I did. And uh, I was I was addressing the fact the responses both Ryan and Brian made in regards to the use for the VR for education purpose for residents and even med students, et cetera, there. And I addressed that, that uh, this this uh, computerized uh, train tool has also been very efficient in in the military for combat readiness. And and um, they've been going on for decades. And what they found out is that not only it also improved their um, combat readiness among the troops, but also for weapon accuracy, and as well as also to be more aware for uh, battlefield awareness, particularly, let's say, if they recognize any particular, like, say, roadside bombing, and et cetera, among those, that they have a much more uh, better improvement in, in awareness and action towards it in case in they're in the battlefield to do that. Ira, I, I have yeah. a question, Ira. Yeah, uh, this is this is for I mean, there's a lot of experienced surgeons in this audience, which is fantastic to see. One of the things that we were unsure of when we started was we knew that people in the earlier sort of that digital generation would readily adopt the technology. But for those of you in the audience that have tried VR, people like JP, Scott, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Buford has tried it and yourself, Ira, where do you think the technology fits based on what you've seen, what you've experienced in the literature you've read? I'm going to defer to the others that you mentioned because I think I've spoken enough. Um, Can I jump in on that? Yep. So um, I, I posted just a little comment on my thinking here. Um, let me zoom out first with the lens, uh, with the business lens, because at the end of the day, it's a business proposition in terms of adoption and scaling. Um, and my perspective is based on working in this space for more than a decade having developed mixed reality and virtual reality and what many of you may know as blueprint which was a company that i helped uh, develop and create and scale um so i think if you if you look at it from the broad standpoint of malcolm gladwell's concept of ten thousand hours to become an expert one of the major value propositions here is that you bend the learning curve and when you do that you reduce complications and when you reduce complications the value proposition of outcome divided by cost is very favorable. That's, I think everybody can understand that. There's a whole bunch of boxes you should check here. And I want to just say uh, uh, for Danny and Ryan, I'm very proud of what you're doing. I think this is a really important endeavor. And whatever I tell you here has been largely, largely collaborative with Danny um, because I talk on this quite a bit. And recently I presented at Harvard Business School's Healthcare Day on the value proposition of virtual reality for exactly this. And it was one of the most attended sessions of that day. But we can practice 
and create virtual errors so we don't do them in the real world. That's crystal clear, and and the and the evidence is is being is growing more and more from the work people like Danny are doing. That's number one. Number two, you gamify surgery, which is much more engaging, and the feedback is much more relevant than when you do something on a on a flat screen or you read about it or you watch a video and you already comment on that. That engagement is the way the brain works. You you retain more. And your memory of the things that you will do in the operating room is, is much more crystallized than if you look at videos on ViewMedia or whatever. Um, the, the other thing that's, that's really interesting is that um, you, you basically have lower cost education, yet kind of have education without borders. One of the things that's very important to understand is, um, you know, Scott, to, to address your question, people have to get on a plane and fly somewhere to go to a meeting. Yet um, you can do, and, and we've done it already, and we're going to do several sessions in Europe and in Asia, you can get people from different countries together in a virtual world. And the avatars create a social presence that they're there. You feel their presence. And the same anxiety you might have in peer, peer interactions happens in the virtual world. And you can demonstrate with the virtual surgery that you're doing the differences of opinion you may have and interact with one another there together in a space, even though you never left your home or your office or whatever. What is the value of that relative to just a Zoom call and et cetera? It's far more engaging. And so this is where this transcends the current paradigm of education. And it's only a matter of time until the evidence catches up and the value proposition becomes very clear because you know the flywheel for this is going to be industry understanding the importance of of blending this into the DNA of how they educate people to use their products. And that then <clears> scales <throat> to education overall. That's really the, the key point here. And you know it, we're lucky because right now we're a little bit early to the game in an environment where healthcare as a business sector is always a late adopter. They're not out there being major innovators, are they? They wait for things to be clear and then they adopt them. Well, that's where this is gonna go in my opinion. Sorry to be so long-winded about it. No, it was great. It was great. Uh, any other comments? Um, I don't want to put people on the spot, but I, I, I I'll happy to comment. Or, or I'm sorry, you want to go first, Greg? Go ahead. Either way, I, I, I'm I'm in the dinosaur category. I'm over sixty, so um, my background's engineering, and and I think the 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 thing I like about this is actually including some biomechanics. You're putting together a fracture construct. And it actually says, hey, you know, this is still a weak construct. You might want to consider a screw here. Or you, you can see in real time how you're stiffening it or, and, and over stiffening it in locked plating or, or things like that. And so um, I think it's great. I haven't tried it yet. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in a little 25 bed critical access hospital and they just called me and wanted to know if I could take care of an inner troke. I said, I think so. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's amazing what you do and don't have for resources, depending on where you are, given I started my career to level one trauma center. So, but, but anyway, um, I think it'd be great. And I, 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 uh, I think the educational possibilities are awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's Scott guys, I think that, you know, we're spending a lot of time, what I've been hearing a lot about, you know, is residency training, but uh, I can tell you when I decided to learn arthroscopic ladder J, I, I flew to Annecy, to Manchester, England, Cincinnati, Ohio, watched videos for I don't know how long and went to about seven different cadaver labs before I felt ready to do my first surgery. And I think that's one of the major reasons that a lot of physicians will not learn new techniques once they are into practice and have been in you know for decades. This is a tool that will allow them to, to venture into new surgical interventions that they may not want to have done previously. So it can really help to democratize the, the, the progression of new technology. And I would see that industry in particular would really embrace this. I would say that if I had uh, intellectual property and a unique surgical technique that I wanted to be able to share and educate, uh, creating one of these VR uh, tools and guides to be able to then share uh, and then incorporate into an OLC environment with use of the cadaver, I think could really help to uh, to really educate doctors even in the later stages of their career. Amazing. Uh, some other people on the, on the call want to comment a little bit? 
Ira, I'll comment from industry. Scott, I think you're you're uh, right on there. And Danny, you mentioned it. Having run many, many cadaver labs without any data except sitting there with a notebook and trying to figure out, number one, what we're going into, where the, 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 uh, the baseline education is in the room is all over the board. I don't think it's anything we've ever captured ahead of time. And certainly I don't think we've ever left a cadaver lab with any meaningful data aside from observation and verbal feedback. And so I find that from an industry perspective, just a incredible leap forward in being able to monetize cadaver training, which is something that industry struggles with all the time and being able to figure out how do I walk into this room with 10, 12, 20 different surgeons and make it a meaningful experience for every one of them so that adoption is accelerated. And I think that's what I'm taking away, which is really amazing. Beth, mm -hmm. let me ask you a question. I think um, you, know, you had spent a number of years at a joint replacement company as a, as a director of marketing. And um, did you, what was the discussions behind the scenes of the confidence level that you were worried about whether the surgeons who chose your implants were putting them in well? Yeah, it was, there were so many variables going in, right? If we were training on posterior stabilizing or cruciate retaining, what was the preference going in? Uh, did they want to resect the femur versus the tibia first? I mean, there were so many variables we were trying to figure out with our audience that I think we left and were hoping for one or two surgeons at a time to be able to accelerate adoption. And it was really lack of data going in and lack of data coming out, right. real data. So I think it's, that's it, right? We couldn't, um, we couldn't figure out what that baseline was. Okay. Um, Just, make, yeah, I, 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 I was gonna make a comment staying on the theme of industry. You know, if I look at this paper, you know, training surgical device reps, of course, we all know that they're extremely valuable in the operating room. Uh, and that there's a spectrum of level of importance based on your volume and your experience with that procedure. Now, if you look at the value proposition of the medical device company to train their sales reps well, that's one offering that you need. There's an understanding that you need to train them well to deliver that sort of support in the operating room. Importantly as well, I think that, you know, when you look at the number of sales reps that churn annually from some of these medical device companies, it ranges between 10 to 30%. That's, a, that's not an insignificant investment for a medical device company to make into a surgical device rep who then leaves for another company for another product. Yeah. There's a carrying cost associated with that as well, because you're paying their salary and they're not in the field supporting as the face of their company your new product or existing product. So there's a massive expenditure when you not only don't train your salespeople well, but you don't train them in a timely way with the risk of churn. And that's part of what this paper addressed. And, you know, Ryan and I were just talking before about doing a thorough cost analysis on training sales reps to proficiency using VR to support the surgeons in the operating room versus doing it traditionally, which is in this case, we happen to do a combination of both where they travel to a national sales meeting. Now, Danny, let me, let me uh, expand a little bit on the metrics mm -hmm. and the data you collect on how well people are doing. These mm -hmm. performance metrics, I outlined yeah. here on the screen. Yeah, That is very intriguing as a way of how comfortable are you with evaluating somebody this way? So I'll talk about the metrics and then I'll talk about the level of comfort and I'll talk about the conversations that happened after people performed in this module. So the things that we measure, and I'll talk about the tibia just to keep it simple in the interest of time is we measure how much tibia people resect in millimeters. We measure the size of the tibial tray, the internal external rotation of the tibial tray, the, tibial tray, the internal external rotation of the brooch, and then the femur, we can actually measure the size of the four-in-one cutting guide that they use as an example. That's one of several. But that, in my mind, is a direct measure of their decision behavior. 
which is an insight that we've just never had. Right. And so the questions that we were getting when someone say cuts the MCL as one of the metrics we measure, what does that mean, Doc, when you cut the MCL when you're doing a primary knee, you know, or an LCL? So it elevates our level of thinking to have them think beyond just learning step one and step two and step three of a widget, which I think is putting people in a box, which I don't think we should ever do in medicine. We should enrich people's thinking and empower them to think beyond you know, their level of education or skill or what have you, their position in a company. So I think that more and more comfort is going to come from measuring people based on the data we're getting because it's actually capturing what they actually decided to do, which we don't have that data at all right now in any measure or any tool of simulation. That's incredible. Uh, any comments about that? Yeah, I want to I want to just bring up a point that uh, JP brought up earlier in Malcolm Gladwell's one, one of his books, which I um, uh, believe was Outliers, possibly, and uh, where people real uh, according to Gladwell, people really need a certain amount of time in his mind, ten thousand hours. The Beatles being a great example, having played all night uh, in Hamburg forever and got their ten thousand hours of working together. Um, this, um, where do you think that every hour spent on simulation versus hour in the OR equally valuable day or Ryan? Ryan, do you want to talk about the JAMA data we yeah. got on? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question. So, um, and kind of going back to what Jose was talking about earlier. So we looked through some of the older literature in terms of simulation and aviation and military, and we, found uh, a great way to study how much you can learn in a simulation or in virtual reality relative to the amount of skill and what you can learn in a real life setting. And so there's different ratios of, of measurable skill that you can have. And the one that we look at was called the transfer effectiveness ratio. So how much measurable skill and knowledge can I obtain from this virtual scenario relative to a comparable uh, real world scenario. And so for our JAMA study, we looked at senior PGY fours and fives who were trained in virtual reality and looked at their performance metrics and then compared it to how much improvement they had relative to a control when putting in an actual augmented base plate in a shoulder uh, during a shoulder arthroplasty. And we saw that uh, there was a very high ratio of skill. So the transfer effectiveness ratio was high, it was 0.79, which means that essentially, so if you were to train for one hour in VR, it would be comparable to around 48 minutes or so in, uh, in a real operative scenario. And that's very powerful. So one of the most studied simulators in general surgery called MIST, uh, which is an older generation of virtual reality there, ratio equivalent was 0.42. So this was significantly higher. And there's a whole number of implications that I think Danny's going to talk about too, just in terms of cost and the efficiency of learning. But um, the other important thing that Dr. Warner talked about too is shifting that learning curve. So if you can accommodate more learning and offset the amount of time that you're learning in VR relative to the real world and the real OR, uh, that can shift your learning curve significantly. And so we looked at a number of studies, I think about 20 or so studies of early learning curves in shoulder arthroplasty, and we plotted it out to see how many uh, you could essentially replicate by learning in VR. And it was around 50 cases of arthroplasty. So I think that's really powerful. One of the things I think of, Ira, when I think of ROI is, uh, especially in education, I think of ROIE your return of investment in education. And there's an accelerated learning curve, but there's a massive cost savings to doing that. And so that's when you think of, you know, the business value proposition of a product like this, I think in terms of ROI and ROE, you know, what is your return on education? It's amazing. Um, you know, I, I actually, as the editor of Joey, I never heard of these journals, JAMA and JBJS. So I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, you know, I, I'm sure they're good. I, I don't really know. Um, let me ask you a, a sub, some loaded questions. Why isn't the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons in part two evaluating performance metrics instead of just looking at their x-rays and how they did it? So they're they're not not thinking about it, Ira. 
Okay. In fact, they are, yeah, they are thinking about it. And, you know, I've had really good discussions with uh, Dr. Martin and the board about, you know, assessing people for a credentialing for the American board. And even here in Canada, where we don't operate much, as you mentioned earlier, <laughs> the Royal <laughs> College of Physicians, Surgeons. So there's, there's certainly an interest in simulation, but there's rigor around introducing something like this at the highest level of credentialing. So I think that as this technology matures, as we continue to gather more data, naturally this seems to be an extension to where this would have application at that level. Yeah. Um, Ryan, you want to make a comment on that? Or you don't have to, you know, it should be fine. Yeah, I don't really can have you, much to add to that. Yeah. Can, I, can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. Greg, Greg, sure. You know, I've, I'm an examiner for ABOS, and, and I think this would be an interesting approach, but but realize, I mean, I'm, I don't submit a case list for my maintenance of certification. I'm doing the web-based longitudinal assessment. And so I review 15 articles and take a test of two questions per article and 30 questions. So you, you, they're not, no one's looking at my x-rays, no one's looking at my outcomes. You know, I submit a case list, you know, with complications. So, I mean, maybe the, the you know, your actual part two of the boards when you're coming out of training or, you know, when you're first starting your practice, but you don't even need to have your practice assessed if you want to do, you know, some of the options. Same way. With so, but I'm, I'm saying, uh, Greg, maybe, maybe they're getting it wrong. Maybe at, you know, 40, 50, and 60 at these 10-year points, this WLA is a political thing. Um, and yeah. maybe we should, if VR could be instituted, we can really um, we can really get some performance metrics out of this. It could be a, <clears throat> a gold standard. I'm not disagreeing. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, trying to get it in the system. Yeah. It's a political fight. It's You're right. It's not a, it's not a, a rational discussion in a lot of ways. I think I think your point is really interesting, Dr. Brown, in that um, this is where do we recognize that there's a problem? It's sort of like asking Tiger Woods to get into the the Masters, asking him a verbal question of what iron he would use on the third hole yeah. when there is 20 degrees of wind and he's sitting in the rough, you know, just off to the right of the of the green. That's effectively, if we use a sports analogy. Yeah. That's what we're doing to assess a uh, level of technical skill and proficiency. And so I think that's where we go back to, do we actually see that there's a problem with what we're doing? And can we address it with some other technologies that may be available? No, it's it, it's absolutely uh, fascinating. How about the, and, and then not only at ABOS, but think in terms of ongoing peer review at mm -hmm. institutions. Um, we have to do every year, an ongoing uh, professional peer evaluation. Um, and if we're doing it surgically, um, it would be sort of wise possible, especially if we have some concerns about someone's time in the operating room. Um, you know, there are people who do uh, latergies uh, in uh, two hours, some in four hours, uh, one surgeon I heard recently in nine hours. I'm like, you know, it, you know if it's... You know, can we get people scored in professional peer reviews as well? There, there's a whole hospital world out there um, to to give an ob a more objective evaluation. You think? What What do you think about that? Well, you know, JP has an experience with uh, George Athwal, who is in London, uh, Joaquin Sanchez Atello, who is in Rochester at the Mayo Clinic, and then JP being in Boston, me in Vancouver. And we were all in this virtual space together. And it was very clear in that, in that experience that we could absolutely evaluate if George or some or JP asked me, Danny, make a 125 degree neck shaft cut at 20 degrees of retroversion. Could I actually do it? Do I actually know what it looks like to do that? And when, so when we talk about making these cuts or these positions, we don't know where the symmetry and asymmetry lie. So what we say and what we do, I think there's a, actually a disconnect there. And I think this is an absolute, there's a way to do this with VR because it affords us the model in context to measure those things in detail to the degree and to the millimeter. Danny, can I, can I expand please. on that? Yeah, please. Um, you know, I'm all 
I understand the literature. There, there are organizations that are known as a, NASA might be one, places like that. And they have, they have uh, standard operating procedures and training tools in place that reduce errors significantly. Most major hospitals are not necessarily high performing organizations because we allow for a wide variation of skill set. And even though we say the patient is the primary thing, um, that's a sort of an elastic uh, area. There, there's a real possibility, the more evidence we have as to the validity of this being a tool that might achieve this, the more likely it'll be adopted as a vehicle, particularly in the generation that is very comfortable with digital technology and being in these kinds of settings. I mean, those of us who, who went to medical school before Google, you know, it's a different story for us. But for the kids that come out of the womb and they're already using digital technology before they can even walk, some of them, this, this is very, uh, very possible. And I, I see the future in healthcare moving more towards high performing organizations like NASA or, or uh, frankly, the airline industry. If you look at the concept of Six Sigma, you know, the number of errors per million events healthcare doesn't even come close. We could move ourselves in that direction with this kind of technology in the future, certainly with digital technology in the future, particularly when you blend in artificial intelligence that will be giving you feedback while you're working on whether or not you're doing what you should be doing. Are you within or outside the parameters appropriate to the plan that you made preoperatively? That's getting a little bit into the weeds, but it's going to become more and more seamless in the future. It's just a question of when industry adopts it and makes it part of its its overall strategic approach. I would make a suggestion that instead of making it a high st stakes uh, issue with the you know board certification, is it would be easier to just do it at the individual hospital level for credentialing for a procedure. And you know, like right now, you need to show well. You have you done five of these in the past year? Well. Again, I, I said earlier, I'm in a 25 bed critical ASCAS hospital. I think I did 60 cases last year. I didn't do five of anything hardly except total knees. And so to say I can't do something, but but this would show you have the the technical skill to, you know, to be credentialed for that procedure in that hospital, but but it doesn't carry the, you know, well, you failed your board certification because you couldn't do one procedure, you know. I think it's a much. I think it'd be much more palatable on a local hospital level yeah. if we if we get to that level. You know, once the technology has proven itself. Ira, I would I would argue that before it becomes part of board certification, it will probably be required as part of your continuing medical education. You have articles you have to read. You have meetings you have to do. You have the self assessment. This is going to be part of the self assessment, and that's going to be. The next step long before because there's so many variables in terms of the interpretation of doing uh this virtual reality so the next thing is going to be this is going to be kind of part of you've got your self-assessment part of it is going to be virtual reality it's great great question great point mike um i'd like to give danny a few minutes to please uh tell us about your company um Joey's not afraid, the journal's not afraid to talk business and, and academics. And, you know, let's just say uh, our hospital wanted to sign up. I mean, you know, I mean, there's, we're talking a lot of, of very important stuff here. And very, another very important thing is to get your hands on this technology. I know you didn't expect that question. So I'm just. No, no, it's a question we get, or I get all the time. So it sounds like Ira, you believe that there's a problem because <laughs> that's the first uh, that's the first hurdle. So the solution makes sense. I think the deployment has become significantly easier. Five years ago, if you were to ask me for a setup, it was extremely complex and not scalable. It required a computer that was really expensive, base stations on a tripod. It was a it was a significant setup. Today, you can buy the headset from Best Buy, you know, from Amazon. And once you get the headset, you just download the software and then there's an annual licensing fee. That's how simple it is. Mm. It, I can tell you it's a fraction of the price of any simulation or any simulator that you'd purchase on the market today. And I'm talking sort of the bigger simulators that sit in a sim center typically. Got it. That's, that's really how easy it is. 
And How then obviously, you... yeah, okay, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, and then we sort of help support the deployment within the organization to teach you how to use it, best use cases, and uh, et cetera. How do you, um, they're obviously on modules, and does it does it come with every module? And yep. how, and how yeah. do you add new, new module? Let's assume uh, company X comes up with a uh, stemless, uh, a new type of stemless um shoulder arthroplasty that mm -hmm. has a new way to put in the glenoid part polyethylene part metal whatever and how, how do you how what's the process of get getting that new new one in how long does it take what's the turnaround time uh so the turnaround time depends on how complex the procedure is but the development process and the design is based on taking what a company wants to build and apply two lenses to it one is the surgical lens, which is what do you need to learn to deliver this product safely in a patient? And number two is from the medical device lens to say what's really important about this product that's unique and special about this particular implant for this problem that's going to make the surgeon want to use it. So that's the lens that we bring to every development. And then the design of it dictates how long it's going to take and the complexity, et cetera. But anything is possible with respect to low, medium, or high complexity. It's fascinating. Hey, Danny, can I ask a question about that? Yes. Mike Cusick from the industry hi. side. Oh, hi, Mike. Hello. Um, yeah, just, can you comment a little bit on how many, you, you just talked about working with a corporation or industry on a certain product. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what's being talked about here, the benefit for the surgeons for some of the continuing education might be in a more generic approach. Mm -hmm. So are there a lot of modules being developed across different procedures that are much more generic to a product or is most of the, are most of the modules being developed around specific products being offered in the market? We're doing both. Okay. Yeah. Which is a really good question, Mike, because I think it, it speaks to our sort of core focus as an organization, which is around education so education can be generic where you're putting in a guide wire, for example, in our slipped epiphysis case, or you're putting in a complex or a primary or a revision total knee in the case of this study uh, that was with a Zimmer Biomed product. Uh, that's great. Um, this has been phenomenal. I think uh, everybody on this call is a, is a who's who in their specialty whether you're a resident or uh, attending or industry. Um, I'd like to get some final uh, comments from um, uh, anyone first and then from Danny and from uh, Ryan. Um, if hey, it's Mike again. I, I think the one thing that um, kind of got to a little bit in the conversation that I bring up again, I have some industry experience with VR as well. But as you're talking about reps or doctors, you really need to think about segmenting them in different ways. So you have the brand new reps, the ones who have never seen a total knee. You have residents who are just trying to get hands on with instruments for cases in any way they can. That's one type of segment. But then you have that very experienced rep or surgeon that isn't even going to want to do this unless something is significantly different enough for them to have to use it to learn. So it could be a new procedure that they're doing. It could be for you know, uh, advanced certification, perhaps, or, or credentialing. But I just, you know, need to think about there's different types of VR you might at, offer to different segments of reps or doctors based on their need. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing point. I think uh, we're, we're scratching the surface. It seems so elegant right now. <laughs> But I'm sure we're just scratching the surface. So let's get some final comments, Ryan, first, and then Danny, about uh, maybe uh, where this is going and where you see it a few years from now. Sure. Yeah, I'll give more time to Danny because I think he has more insight. I'm just very happy that you guys had me and uh, that you're all here to listen. And I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. You guys are all great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ryan, for obviously participating in this study and Ira for hosting this journal session. I think for me, Ira and everybody, I'm extremely excited about the potential of this technology. Imagine being on the ground floor when Google was being discussed or you know, the iPhone or a cutting edge breakthrough technology like that, which could change how we think, how we gather data in, especially in such a conservative industry like healthcare and in surgery specifically in this use case. 
if you were to ask me six months ago, Danny, what would you be thinking about today? I wouldn't have been able to tell you. This is how the technology and what we can do is sort of, we continue to push the boundaries. I think the sky is the limit. And I think Ryan pointed this is we don't have a ceiling on this right now. And that's the part that excites me the most is that the techno the hardware continues to advance. What we can do with the computing power continues to advance. So we have no idea where this is going to go. But from what we've seen today, it's extremely exciting. I think the value proposition, both from a business perspective and from a patient care perspective, is already clear that you know it'll be interesting to see what the next two to five years brings. Can I make one comment? I know we're yeah, please, JP, we're yeah, talk. hour. Um, Danny, you mentioned Google. Um, John Doerr is the venture capitalist that was the first person to fund Google, which started in, you know, in a garage or something. And he wrote a book entitled Measure What Matters. And the problem with new technology and scaling it is that um, getting it onto the radar and getting it into something where it really matters, it, usually the ideas predate the technology available to scale this. And Danny, you just mentioned how the technology has made this uh, easier proposition to get involved with. Now we have to scale that up in terms of industry wanting to scale it. It's no different than what happened with Netflix, which named itself before the internet was able to support Netflix. They knew that the internet was gonna develop and that's why they developed Netflix, which you used to get DVDs you know, for. So I, I think that's where we are right now. Digital technology is nascent in its, in its uh, beginnings now, and it's going to scale enormously, particularly when you blend in AI into all of this, this is going to be um, the next big thing, I think, in healthcare. That is a great summing up statement, JP, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone uh, being here tonight. Uh, this is uh, recorded, it'll be edited um, um, and available on the Joey website. Uh, and the journal, I, again, uh, encourage people to look at the article that uh, Ryan and Danny did uh, for Joey. Um, and I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I know uh, people are very busy. And um, these are uh, just just great discussions with the authors. And Danny and Ryan, I can't, can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to sign off, everybody. Take care.